everybody. I'm a grateful believer and an enthusiastic believer, but yet a humble believer in our Lord Jesus Christ. I struggle with everything that you can imagine. And through my story, I'll be listing my struggles. But I am celebrating recovery from drug addiction, alcoholism, and the criminal lifestyle I once lived. My name's Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Hi. So here's my story. I was conceived by my drug addicted parents. My mom was 15 and my dad was 24. When my alcoholic grandparents found out my mom was pregnant, they forced them to go to Mexico to get married. However, throughout my life, my mom has exposed that instead of getting married in Mexico, she wished she had illegally aborted me. I felt unwanted. On May 22nd, 1972, I was born addicted to heroin and alcohol. Growing up for, for me wasn't a pleasant experience. My biological father abandoned me when I was three. And later I met him when I was 18 years old and he told me heroin was the only thing he lived for. I had lived in 18 homes that I could remember. I felt lost, different school every year, different home every year. Half my life, I was a Hells Angels bikers brat with dad number two. And every adult during this season of my life was a cokehead on heroin, PCP, and drank alcohol like water. My most memorable time with biker dad, with my biker dad, was when I walked in on him and his friends shooting up drugs in the house that I had lived in. And he took me on lots of Harley rides after he would stuff my backpack full of drugs. I felt used. Now, after they split up, my mom brought dad number three into my life. He took me on lots of road trips and had lots of conversations with me on how to deal drugs. And he nicknamed me was ugly. Now, on these road trips, he would smoke marijuana with all the windows rolled up and the heater on. And he told me he did that on purpose. So I would shut up and go to sleep. I felt not seen nor heard. I can remember this at age 12, and this was very normal for me growing up. Now, FYI, these road trips, well, they also were drug runs. At bedtime, I woke up, on, up to dad number three peeing on me in his coked out and drunken state. My mom with all my dads, she made me take care of the household chores, raise my five siblings, take them to school, do their homework and mine too. I would read them bedtime stories and all kinds of other stuff to make her life easier. Now, all the while, I was a child, too, trying to grow up. And my needs, they didn't matter. I felt unworthy. I was forced to grow up way too fast so my mom could entertain herself and stay drunk and loaded. If I didn't do things her way, which was never, according to her and my dad's, Sherry just wasn't good enough. I always got name called, call, I got name called, ridiculed, screamed at, and beat daily. So I lived in fear daily. And I was told to go play marbles on the freeway. Anxiety. And at times in her rage, she would break my belongings. I felt like gutter trash. So as I grew older, my mom did not take, she would not let me be feminine. She did, and she tried her hardest to turn me to be a lesbian by body shaming me and made me feel guilty by calling me not nice names when I would start liking boys. So yes, I have body image issues and lo uh, very low self-esteem. And I had gender confusion there for a while. I was not allowed to have any friends come over ever. I felt lonely. So I learned quickly to do things perfectly to avoid the abuse. And yes, I do struggle with perfectionism. Now I did play basketball for quite so many years, same as softball. I was always a starter. In band, I played a clarinet for eight years. I was always a section leader. I had worked since I was 16, and I was always a trainer. I won lots of awards, and I was the first of two out of the six, six of us kids to graduate high school and go to college. And that includes all four of my dropout parents. So ultimately, I wanted to make my four parents proud of something I did. Codependency and I, we go deep. A kind hug, some positive affirmation. I needed security, proper guidance, support, love, affection. Yeah, that never happened for me. I've developed rage and anger. My parents did teach me to be a dope dealer and a criminal, and I did well. The physical, emotional, mental abuse I suffered was awful. I learned early in my life some coping skills, such as making myself bleed by all means necessary. Yeah, self-harm and self-hatred. 
when I was 14, I was babysat. I had to, I babysat for my parents as friends, children on the weekends. And the way they would pay me was with alcohol. And this is where my addict side came alive in me. So from this point on, I tried everything to alter my mind and escape my pain and trauma. And I definitely wanted to stay that way. Such as sniffing drenched socks and gasoline, robo tripping, took lots of no to dose, and I drank opium with my friend's mom after school. And I smoked weed and drank alcohol daily for many years. However, I still had to maintain my grades, sports, household chores, and all my siblings' needs and do what my parents told me. And I did not falter. I was a very functional addict that no one knew about nor cared about. In college, I got pregnant and my parents, well, they tried their hardest to get me to get an abortion that, we, that they were very happy to pay for. Well, I decided to keep my son clean and sober and I had no help from his alcoholic father. And when my son was eight, his dad ended up committing suicide. Now, during my pregnancy, my parents told me no man would want me or my baby. So when my son was four months old, I met my first love. He was fresh out of prison. And he quickly showed me a, another way to live and escape my pain and trauma. He introduced me to crystal meth. I started with a couple of lines, then the pipe. And soon after that, I started slamming dope. And that became my new normal. And on down days, I slammed heroin. And I took lots of LSD and mushrooms just for fun. And at times to support my addiction, I had to use my body. I stole lots of stuff and I beat up people that got in my way. I knew I was no good for my son, so I gave him to my parents. He would be better off with them than Child Protective Services and me. And I'm glad I did because shortly after that, my prison boyfriend and I, we rented an apartment next to the one that we had lived in for the purpose to cultivate, manufacture, and distribute 65 indoor hydroponic marijuana plants. Back then it was very illegal. Weed was. And eventually we got raided and I went to jail. When I was released, I didn't do what the judge told me. And I didn't care because my drug in, it was in full effect. Every day was a mission on how I was gonna get high that day. And my criminality, it got very bad. I, was, I had learned how to steal cars. Now we kept these stolen cars in the trap house we had lived in. And under that underground was a meth lab and after, and right after I slammed a speedball, which is heroin and crystal meth mixed, I was in my second raid. The police, well, they tied me to the crime of grand theft autos. And I had a few felonies at this point and lots of mis misdemeanors on my record. I was in really bad shape. And the cops, well, they took me to the hospital before they took me to jail. And they handcuffed me to the hospital bed. My doctor informed me that my heart almost exploded because the amount of drugs that were in my body and back to jail I went. I weighed 95 pounds. I was scared, lost, strung out, alone, broken and hopeless. Now, while I was in prison, I was invited to a church group. And this is the first time I've ever heard the name Jesus and I got introduced to him. And this is where my faith journey began. I accepted Jesus, my one true father, into my life that moment. They gave me a Bible. I studied it day and night. Jesus gave me my first gift, the gift of hope. It says in Zechariah 9-11, because the covenant I made with you sealed in my blood, I will free you prisoners from death. Now, a few weeks later was my sentencing day. And the judge, well, he told me that I was facing 10 years in prison. However, Jesus came for me the miracle worker, the healer, the way maker, the redeemer for the lost, the abandoned, the broken, the abused, and the addicted, just like me. He graced me, and he had a definitely a different plan for me. However, I did serve 16 months in prison, and when I was released, I had turned my entire life over to the care of God, and a new creation was born, me. I did not go back to the only life I knew, of utter sin and darkness, not for a person, not for a shirt, nothing. Following his light was and is my new norm. I found a church, Calvary Costa Mesa, California. Pastor Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie, they were my first pastors for the next seven years that spoke God's language to me. I learned a great deal from them as I continually focus on God. 
I continued to follow the judge's instructions. I paid my restitution, completed my parole. I had to go to tons of AA and NA meetings and criminal meetings. I've had lots of therapy and outpatient treatment centers over the years. I got my son back. And during the beginning of my new life, though, I was homeless. The Lord was making me an honest woman and purifying my heart ever since. Thank God. I slept wherever I could, such as abandoned buildings, park benches, couch surfed. I ate whatever I can get my hands on, such as local food banks, tuna straight out of the can, and dry top ramen. Other people's trash literally became my treasure. I got baptized in Laguna Beach. Jesus was, is, and always be my guiding light. My shepherd and his voice, it's all I seek. I continuously learn God's ways. Although it's not easy for someone like me from the world and in the church, conforming into his image, I have experienced church hurt. However, Jesus reminds us to not get distracted by other people's opinions or have self-doubt, negative self-talk, and people please. Yeah, I had all those too. But Jesus says, don't believe those lies and keep focus on him and put my faith over every fear. It says so in Matthew 14, 27 through 32. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Take courage. I am here. Come to me and I will not let you sink. Well, his promises, they always come true. He saves. He rescues. And he is always with us. So I constantly stay focused on God, the Bible, the Holy Spirit pastor's teachings, and I continually take growth groups. I had and still have a lot to learn, and it didn't take me long for me to find a job, get an apartment, a car. No, it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy road. I had to make a lot of hard decisions as I prospered, but it is all a necessary part of his plan and is worth every step of the way. Now, for the next five years, I prospered and was ready for love. And I prayed for my soulmate. At my second job is where I met my husband and I did something I've never done before. I asked a guy out on a date and he accepted. And we have been inseparable since. I have had the privilege to witness my then boyfriend accept Jesus Christ as his only father because he's never had one. God has blessed and gifted us a 25 year marriage, four children and two grandsons. Now, in the beginning, we were members of Saddleback Church, and Rick Warren was our senior pastor. My husband and my oldest son, they got baptized there. Children's Ministries was a big part of my kids, my husband's, and my life, as well as Christian Women's Ministries were always huge to me. They still are. I raised my my kids on God's truth for his kingdom, no matter the curveballs that Satan keeps throwing in my way. Now, over time, Alan, my husband, became a very busy corporate career man by day. And by night, I had worked five nights a week. So one of us would be home to raise our children. He and I became strangers, though, because money, success, and materialism, they kept my husband busy, and he didn't have a whole lot of time for family and me. I was overwhelmed, and those familiar feelings of mine, of rejection and abandonment, they resurfaced. The neglect that I was receiving, my kids started to rebel, and our dysfunctional families were up in our business, and life, well, it just started to get ugly. Now, in 2012, I had injuries on both my feet that my doctors prescribed me Norcos, Oxys, Percocets, and Dilaudids and my addiction to opiates took over presidents in my life for the next five years until I had to have surgeries on my feet. Now to support that addiction to pain pills, I doctor shopped to get as many opiates as I could the legal way. And when that wasn't enough, I was buying them off the streets. My average I was popping was 20 pills a day. Now after my recovery of my foot surgeries, my doctor, well, they cut me off cold turkey which led me right back to therapy and outpatient treatment at an outpatient treatment center every day on Suboxone maintenance because the withdrawals were not fun. So in 2015 to 2020, my family, well, we were going through some really hard storms 
and I was getting beat down and neglected by everyone that looked me in the face and said they had loved me. I didn't know yet how to deal with these things I, I heard about hurts, habits, and hangups. So I went back into my addiction and relapsed to my drug of choice, crystal meth. No one knew and no one cared. Again, I functioned well. I met everyone's needs. Now, in, back in 2010, my oldest son was a varsity freshman wrestler, and he was playing football for the last 10 years. He did get a, a sho so, excuse me, shoulder, shoulder injury that the, just, the uh, doctor had prescribed him opiates, and his addiction began that led to heroin and eventually fentanyl. I almost lost him twice to his overdose in ICU. God told me to tough love him and stop babying my addict or I was going to end up burying my addict. And I'm so grateful today that I can tell you back in July, he just celebrated two years clean and sober. And he is my prodigal son. He's doing quite well. Now, my biker dad, a long time ago in his addiction, he died a long time ago in his addiction. And in 2020, my other three parents, they died. Dad number three first from a brain injury that he literally drank himself to his death. My mom died of cardiac arrest as her body shut down to her lifelong drug and alcohol abuse. While my biological father, he died just a couple months after her death due to his lifelong heroin addiction. His organs shut down. All my siblings, they have addiction issues. Again, I lost hope. I snapped and I picked up alcohol in January, 2021. I drank every minute of every day for five months. On May 26th, 2021, it was 2 a.m. I was alone at a park and I drank a handle of vodka. And when I tried to walk, I fell flat on my face. And I remembered, all I remember that night was the paramedics picking me up off the ground face down and later my husband picking me up at the hospital. This was the first time I've ever blacked out. Now the very next day on May 27, 2021, I checked myself into light, the Lighthouse Residential Rehab for the, last, the next three months. And that was the very best thing I've ever done for myself. They took away every distraction. Jesus and I, we reconnected. And the other girls, they noticed the relationship to God. And asked me to share Jesus, pray, read scripture with them. And of course I did. Now, part of my treatment plan there is when I was introduced to Celebrate Recovery. And I am forever grateful for that ministry. It has changed my life dramatically. And my hope is back. I received tons of professional help in every direction for my life through things called the 12 Steps and 8 Principles. Life-changing testimonies. In the church and in CR, everywhere. God's working. Now, when I went home, I did plug into a few CRs, Celebrate Recoveries, and my husband had confessed that he had been battling a sex addiction, betrayal. He fell to his knees, and he begged God for his and my forgiveness, mercy, and grace, and that he wanted to make things right between us and our family. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, it says to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her believing husband and the husband. He shall not divorce his believing wife. Although I don't trust people, however, I do trust Jesus in people. In Mark 10, 8 and 9, it says, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Whatever God has united, Join together, let no one separate that unity. So we went back to our local church. It was called The Rock in Temecula, California. And I redirected and he redirected our lives back into God's hands. Five months later, God had told us to move. And God opened the door. He spoke and we listened and moved to Portland, Oregon. He brought us here to bring Celebrate Recovery to Manor House Church. And in Jeremiah 18, one through six, it says, God told Jeremiah to go to the potter shop to learn a lesson. And Jeremiah said, I did as God had told me and found that the potter, the will, but the jar he was making, it just didn't turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it. 
into a lump of clay and started over. Then the Lord gave this message. Can I not do for you what the potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. So this ne next chapter of my family faith journey is reshaping us, molding us. And I humbly, we all are humbly surrendering our lives back into God's hands to do his will, follow his calling on my life, spreading the good news and giving back to the communities I know very well. The Lord has called me to be his light in the darkness and be his voice, hands and feet. I care deeply for addicts and the unhoused. And my favorite step is step 12, having a spiritual awakening. I volunteer everywhere, such as rehabs, shelters. I hang out and get to know people in encampments. Spreading the gospel is my favorite. And I recently, three months ago, joined Celebrate Recovery Insiders. I'm part of a prison ministry now, too. I've enjoyed being a residential counselor. And I absolutely love being a ministry leader at Manor House Rocky View. And my husband is my co-leader. Celebrate Recovery is helping him, too, with God leading the, the way in restoring the Hill family back. As I continue on my road to recovery and grow on my spiritual faith journey, I encourage you, whether you're a newcomer to Christ or Christian curious, or you've been doing the Jesus thing for a while, There's support everywhere, and you're never alone. Now, keep in mind, recovery, Jesus, this Christian thing, it's not a hobby. It's a lifestyle. And being Christian, it's absolutely fun. I've had more fun in my life being a Christian than I have in the world. This new life I have in Oregon, Oregon is absolutely amazing. And now I have been spiritually fed by amazing pastors speaking God's language to me on a much deeper level. Jesus is always working, turning all of our weaknesses into strengths. And he promises that no hurt goes wasted. Giving, he gives back what the locust stole. And his promises, they always come true. For those who believe, repent, surrender, submit, and obey. I am finding on my road, of, road to recovery that through my trust issues, that proper healthy love, it does exist. And good people, they exist too. And there is a lot of sweetness in life. I receive and accept I have a purpose worth living for, God's kingdom. My life experiences of living in the world for the world, it has chewed me up and spit me out. Thank God. So now with the support of my accountability partners, and trust me, I have a lot. I have a wonderful sponsor and my church family. I love them. I'm not alone anymore. Now, through my step studies, I have continually taken time to invest in myself. I'm learning daily through all of this. Celebrate Recovery is helping me fill those yucky places, my hurts, habits, and hangups with God's goodness, mercy, and grace. He is filling my cup by instructing me to teach, evangelize, testify, heal, cast out demons, and be his hope dealer. Leading people to Christ. It's my favorite thing to do, planting seeds everywhere for him. Now I got rebaptized in my local church last summer. So now I am and I receive that I'm ambassador of freedom. He is restoring me and many others at the same time. He's doing miracles in all of our lives, whether we recognize it or not. And he is doing that for us all. Why? Because he is love. His love is the best kind of love. So we don't go back into those addictive, compulsive behaviors that got us here in the first place. Because he loves and forgives us all. I have learned in my spiritual journey that this broken world, it's full of lies. And living in it, it's done me no good. Today I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. I'm delivered. I'm loved the right way. And I'm his rescue story. And this is true for each of you. If you choose Team Jesus and Christ-centered support groups, find a local church, a new family, for whatever hurt and hang-up you have. 
there is freedom and there is in the power of his blood. Now, Jesus says, shame off of each of you and shame off of me. In Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, it says, forget what happened before and do not think about the past. Look at the new thing I am going to do. It's already happening. Don't you see it? I will make the road in the desert and rivers in the dry land and bring and brings the dead back to life. He is our way maker. So I encourage you all, whether you, whether you are Christian curious or you've been following Jesus around for a while, depend on the Holy Spirit. It is crucial in our journey called life. It never leaves us nor neglects us. It doesn't cripple us. It doesn't hurt us. It says so in John 14, 15 through 18. If you love me, obey my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. He is our counselor and our comforter because he loves. So we ought to love. Now, remember, Jesus, he suffered a great deal to remove our guilt and shame. So addict, whatever your struggle is, hold your head up high. Receive the gifts God offers us all. Because every addict is a precious lost soul who God loves and wants to rescue. And to those that have any idols and strongholds, the Lord definitely is after you too. And that's a great thing. And I'm here to testify that change, it's hard, but absolutely necessary. And we have to go through the uncomfortable to get comfortable, to be free. Your life matters and mine does too. There is hope and freedom from every hurt, habit, and hang up. So Christian, suit up because spiritual warfare, it's definitely a thing. Put on that full armor of God. Put that belt of truth on that breastplate of righteousness. Put those shoes of peace on your feet. Hold that shield high of faith, that helmet of salvation, and that sword of the spirit. That's found in Ephesians 6, 15 through 17. Jesus, recovery, and God family, it works if you work it. Why? Because we're all worth it. Jesus says so. So it is my honor and my privilege to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to leave you with this. God does not make any mistakes.